Amen. Thank you, Fran. Thank you so much. I actually have that picture, that picture entitled Jesus Laughing. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but uh, it, it brought such a blessing to me. I tracked down the, uh, the painter of it and had a delightful conversation with him. He's a Catholic brother who truly loves Jesus, and I think he captured something uh, in that picture that we need to see. It's a beautiful picture, and I, I didn't realize there was a song about it, so I appreciate hearing that tonight. Thank you. Well, I, I sure want to wish all of our dads a happy Father's Day. You know, I can't think of anyone that I'm more proud of than good dads, faithful husbands, soldiers of Jesus, except for maybe moms, but dads, you're up there really, really close second. And tonight's message is, is for all of us. It's for dads, it's for moms, it's for every Christian. It was for those in Paul's day, it's certainly for us today. You know, as a, as a preacher, preaching through the books of the Bible, it's not always easy. Sometimes it has a way of taking you out of your comfort zone. Uh, maybe it doesn't play to your strengths. Nevertheless, I think it's an extremely helpful and healthful for the pastor and the people to be exposed to that kind of preaching. I believe it gives us a, a, a well-rounded exposure to the truths of Scripture. And we're going to look to the eighth chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in a day when they wrote letters. Some of you might remember actually sending a letter at one time in your life or receiving letters. Man, it was great. We had paper, we had pens with which to write the letter, and we would fold the paper up and we'd put it in an envelope and we'd put a stamp on it and we'd take it out to our mailbox. And then the mailman or the mailwoman would pick it up and it would deliver it right to the mailbox of our intended recipient of the letter. It was, it, was a, it was a phenomenal thing. And for those who have never experienced it, I, I really, I truly feel sorry for you. It's great to get a nice letter. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to read the entirety of the chapter. It's a brief chapter. Paul said now, and, and it will sound rather irrelevant as we read it. So it's my job to try to show you the relevancy of it because Aside from the particular issue he's addressing, there are enduring principles that flow out of this, this discussion Paul is having with the Corinthians. He is probably writing them in response to a letter that, or a messenger that uh, he has uh, received with prepared questions because you can see him picking up on the issues that have previously been introduced. He says in chapter 8, verse 1, now about food sacrificed to idols. So I have a strong suspicion that these Corinthians wanted some information about how do we deal with this issue, Paul. Paul says we know that we all possess knowledge, and knowledge puffs up. Knowledge is not bad, but knowledge without love can puff one up, make them proud, condescending. But love always builds up. And I guess if I want you to take anything away from this service tonight, it would be that particular emphasis followed by one we'll see in a moment. Love is the answer. Love builds up. Love never tears down. Love never dismantles. Love edifies. Love strengthens. Love encourages. I love the word encourage. In courage. To put courage into. Love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. No matter how much you know, you don't know all you need to know and should know and could know. But the man who loves God 
is known by God. So then, after, uh, so then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even, even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or, in, or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, There is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols. He's talking about believers who came out of that old life in this Gentile world surrounded by idols. There are places in the world today, they worship idols not just uh, more than one God, they worship literally hundreds, hundreds of gods. He said some people are still so accustomed to idols, they're still, their life is still so tainted by idol worship that when they eat such food, they think of, think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol, and since their conscience is weak or fragile, It is defiled, but food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. However, we're coming to the word however, but I've placed it at the beginning of the sentence because I want you to know it's there. In verse 9, this is the second verse that I hope you will commit to memory and practice. Be careful. Love builds up, and this is an expression of how that love acts. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you, sin, when you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, bottom line is, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. Now, let's get into this a little bit, but I want you to keep in mind verse 9 because I think it's the undergirding principle of the entire chapter. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. This is my third sermon from uh, this 1 Corinthians series. Chapter 1, chapter 6, and now chapter 8, and a couple of weeks, chapter 11. And in each one, including this one, of course, I suggest that 1 Corinthians can be more fully understood and appreciated if we keep in mind Paul's introductory and foundational thoughts in chapter 1, where he sets up an ongoing comparison of the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world. You can almost stamp that across every single chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, Paul presents us with the theme of this chapter, the summation, the essence of it right here in verse 9, and it's the exercise of your freedom. So first of all, I'd like to note that we have been given freedom in Christ. Paul wouldn't be talking about the exercise of our freedom if we didn't have freedom. We have an incredible and glorious freedom in Christ. We never want to forget that the Christian life is a life of freedom. Could I get an amen? Christ set us free. Freedom like this world can never know. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Are you free tonight? He said, when the, when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And keep in mind, he was writing to religious people. I mean, 
very religious people who thought they were free. They thought they were free, but they were in the worst kind of bondage. The worst kind because it was in the name of all that was holy, but it wasn't freedom. The worst kind because it was a bondage accompanied by blindness. The Apostle Paul, the author of 1 Corinthians, reminds us in his letter to the Galatians that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. In fact, he says, stand firm and do not let yourselves be a burden again by a yoke of slavery. So Paul is fighting for your freedom and mine. Now, the world's wisdom, of course, they got it backwards. They've got everything backwards or upside down. Because in the world's estimation, the Christian is in bondage. They actually feel sorry for you and me. Because what we have, quote, given up. What we've left and we've lost as Christians. Well, the truth is, it's the unbeliever who's in blindness and bondage. The Christian has been given freedom. God's freedom. And what could be more glorious, my friend, than the freedom that God who made us will now give us? So every one of us should be a freedom fighter. Every one of us should seek to understand that freedom and hold on to it and cherish it as a gift Christ has given us. I'm a freedom lover. I cherish the freedom I found in Christ, and I celebrate it. And that freedom has given me an incredible joy. I want to live in all the freedom Jesus provides me. And I'm determined not to let anybody take it from me. And Paul certainly highly prized the believer's freedom. He fought tooth and nail to keep that freedom intact. He went face to face with, of all people, Simon Peter. Peter who buckled and compromised his freedom under the bluster of that circumcision party. So Paul is no legalist, and he doesn't want you or me to be one. He wants us to know our freedom and to live in our freedom and to help others find their freedom. And if you're not free in Christ, something is wrong, tragically wrong. There is some lack of understanding, some deficiency of faith, some glorious truth that has escaped you. And the last thing a person who's been in bondage all their life needs is another form of bondage. And too often the problem is while Christ sets us free, religion puts us in bondage. Religion binds and blinds And religion steals and kills every good thing Christ gives. Religion takes our peace, our faith, our joy, and our freedom. Religion is so close to the real thing and so far from the real thing. I want nothing to do with religion and everything to do with Christ. And we need to guard our freedom because it's a treasure paid for by Him and given to every one of us. We have freedom in Christ. Praise God for it. Secondly, bring that word however into the picture. However, we have been given a caution with our freedom. And it's a caution from an apostle. He identifies himself in chapter 1, verse 1. An apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God, the apostle Paul. And a couple of guiding principles here I hope you'll take home with you tonight. I'm looking at my watch, and the little boy said, Daddy, what does it mean when the preacher looks at his watch? And Dad said, nothing, son, absolutely nothing. (laughs) But I'm looking at it. I know it's there, and I know it's ticking. Would you take home a couple of guides tonight in your fleshing out of the Christian life, in your interaction with other believers? First of all, love must govern our freedom. 
Love must govern our freedom. Freedom must not be understood as being free to do whatever we want, whenever we want. We must have guiding principles to keep that freedom from becoming a stumbling block. As important as our freedom is, there's something else even more important. The greatest of these is love. And so Paul says in verse 1, love builds up. He says in verse 9, be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. I can have a knowledge an awareness that gives me freedom, but that freedom should never go beyond the boundaries of love. I can do some things because of the knowledge I have, but I won't do them because of the love I have. Love won't let me do everything I could. Now here's the setting, and it, I know it sounds irrelevant, but I think we can make modern day application. The background of these verses, Paul is writing to believers who lived in a world of idolatry where there were many, many false gods that were worshipped. And there would be, would be occasions when food was offered uh, to those idols in their form of worship. And then that food, after the worship event, would be taken to the marketplace and made available to the public, or it might even be served uh, at a meal in a home. And so the question became, should the Christian have anything to do with food that has been sacrificed to idols? Well, for some believers, to do so would have offended their conscience. And when they saw other believers freely partaking in this food, they were upset, they were bewildered, confused, and Paul is trying to address that issue with the Corinthians. Now, we don't face that issue today. But Paul's teaching here is still relevant because he gives us some guidelines and some principles to follow. And I believe those guides, guidelines cross culture or, and they cross oceans ge the, geographically and culturally. I don't believe... Uh, there are any boundaries to them. I believe they are applicable to any believer for any time in any place. Love must govern our freedom. And then he tells us love, in verse 9, acts with care. You have freedom. Don't ever forget that. But don't let your freedom cause someone else to fall. Don't let your freedom weaken the faith or undermine the peace or dilute the joy of a brother or sister in Christ. Paul is very clear about that in verse 9. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Freedom never trumps love. And love is always careful and considerate of others. My freedom is never more important than my brother's state or fate. Celebrate your freedom, but be really careful with it. Freedom is a gift, but it's also a test. Handle it with care and consideration for others. And really, there are three reasons here, at least three, Paul gives why he was careful with the exercise of his freedom in verse 9 so that it doesn't become a stumbling block to others. In chapter 9 in verse 12, so that he, he, we won't hinder the gospel. And in chapter 9 verse 19, to win as many as possible. So we always live in the context of this, this awareness of the impact our actions have have on others with the knowledge that our carelessness could be a stumbling block but carefulness can be a stepping stone our carelessness with freedom can hinder the gospel but carefulness 
with freedom can help the gospel. Carelessness with freedom can alienate others, but carefulness can attract others. Now, I think there uh, is an obvious modern-day counterpart to this issue the Corinthians were facing and Paul was writing about. And, and I, that, to me, would be the issue of alcohol, drinking alcoholic beverages. Now, we know it's a sin to ever get drunk. The Bible is very clear. It says, be not drunk with wine. Uh, in, in fact, anything else. Pastor was saying before the service, he was this suit has a little dizzying effect when you're up close and he was feeling a little uh, intoxicated so I sent him out to the nursery and he's back now but he's, he's at a safe distance so people would say well okay I understand the Bible teaches we should never get drunk but what about an occasional glass of wine or Budweiser well I think Paul's teaching can really enlighten us here by the way, I think, I think we need wiser buds instead of more bud wiser. Many years ago, and there I go again using that phrase, I did an informal study of the men in my Wednesday night men's group. There was about 80, 90 men in that group. And out of curiosity, I asked them how many had had a serious problem in their past with alcohol. And I was stunned. This was 35 years ago, and I still vividly recall the response. I was stunned to see about 40% of them raise their hands. And I knew if any one of those 40 percenters ever saw this preacher drinking a glass of wine or anything with alcohol in it, it would throw them for a loop. It would really upset them and confuse them. I knew for their sake that could never happen. You know, just looking at the, the alcoholic industry, just looking at it, you have to ask, what good does alcohol bring to society? And I actually thought of a, a list of uh, benefits. It benefits the alcoholic industry it benefits automotive repair shops with increased revenue. It benefits hospital emergency rooms and law enforcement with job security. It benefits lawyers with more clients and more cases. It benefits advertisers and the media. If you just sit down and kind of do a logical cost benefit analysis of alcohol. Alcohol doesn't come out looking very good. And the wisdom of the world, remember that? The wisdom of the world says, well, you know, that's his problem. That's not my problem. I don't have to concern myself with everybody's scruples. Why should I sacrifice my freedom over his issues? But God's wisdom says, love builds up. Be careful that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block. It's love. It's always love. You see, not only is there a huge difference in the world's wisdom and God's wisdom, there's a huge difference between the world's love and, and the way God loves. And if you want to know how God loves, Paul is kind enough to let us in on that. Just a few chapters away, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and Verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, four verses, he gives us about 15 traits of God's kind of love. And two of those are especially connected with this issue in this chapter. He says, love is not self-seeking. 
Love always thinks of others. Love is interested in the end game. Love follows the repercussions and the trails. Love sees the big picture. It is not self-seeking, and love always protects. God's love acts so differently than the world's. God's love goes the second mile. God's love gives up one's own rights. God's love turns the cheek. God's love lives carefully with a heightened consideration of others. So that's what Paul preached. Not only what he preached, it was how he lived. Paul actually practiced what he preached. What a novel idea. Because you get to chapter 9, look what he says in verse 11. He said, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. And then look what Paul says in verse 19. He says, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. That is, that's the way love thinks. That's the way love talks. That's the way love acts. And some of you, if you're like me, you might be a little contrarian once in a while. You're thinking, well, what's the use of having freedom if you can't exercise it? What's the use of having freedom if you can't have it? What's the use of having freedom if you can't enjoy it? It's like having a million dollars and living like a commoner. It's a great question. The problem is it's the wrong question. You're not giving up your freedom. You'll always have freedom. Just like the millionaire, well, always have his money he's got it but he doesn't flaunt it he spends it wisely and I think another thing to keep in mind here is that many people don't think of in this in this setting is in some cases this may be a situational issue this may be episodic it may be a temporary inconvenience and accommodation for the sake of peace and unity and edification. Because Paul speaks of some people in verse 7, and the weak brother in verse 11, and my brother in verse 13. Elsewhere, Paul talks about becoming all things to all men, that I might win some. So even if the eating of food offered to idols is no problem for you, even if you feel a complete freedom to indulge, even if your conscience is not bothered by it at all, for the sake of some people, for the sake of my brother, I will not allow my freedom to become a stumbling block. Do you kind of get the picture here? Do you kind of get the message that maybe we have responsibility to others as we live out this Christian life? No, truly, if we all lived unto ourselves, And unto God alone, if our actions had no effect upon our fellow believers, the issue and challenge of personal conduct would be greatly simplified. But, and there's always one, isn't there? That's not the case. We all have an effect upon others. We have a responsibility to one another. Therefore, I think we need a standard, a guiding principle to negotiate through that minefield, a guiding principle that takes into account our relationship not only to God, but to men as well. And Paul presents it, though I am free and belong to no one, I make myself a slave 
to everyone. Martin Luther summed it up well. He said, a Christian through faith becomes free from all men, but through love is made the servant of all. Commentator Alfred Neeson said, if we're not willing when necessary to forego slight passing pleasures, however legitimate, for the sake of others, then we have not learned Christ. Because Christ's way is always love, and love is always careful. Love is always the right way. Love always wins. When in doubt, love. I told my wife what I was preaching tonight, and it's, it's an odd sermon. It's one I don't know if I've ever dealt with very much. And I told her I wasn't really sure how to end the message. Perhaps a retreat out the back door would be the answer. I don't know. She said, just say, turn to your neighbor and say, is there something I can do for you this week to show my love for you? Good idea, good wife, would you stand? Would you turn to your neighbor and say, isn't it about time you started loving me? No, no don't say that. <laughs> but maybe you would do, be willing to do this. Just turn to your neighbor and say, is there something I can do for you this week to show my love for you? And now, don't respond by asking for money. <laughs> Go a little deeper, okay? God bless you as you do that tonight.